Pixel of the Month series, January 2023. Hukusa, the splendor of Japanese gift covers. Good morning. Thank you all for joining me. This is the first in our Textile of the Month series for the new year, 2023. We'll be discussing Hukusa, which are Japanese gift giving covers. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. The very first Fukusa that I actually ever encountered was a gift given to me uh, of this lion cub. And it's remained one of my favorite through all of these years. I think it's just a delightful piece. So I'm glad to be starting with it. As you can see, it's painted entirely by hand using sumi, a type of Japanese ink, mixed with a little bit of soy milk and just a hint of Japanese indigo added to give it a little bit more uh, life, uh, take away from just the stark black and white. All sorts of images may be used on Fukusa. In this case, you see deer with the pine trees in the background in the sun. Anything with this sun in the background may appropriately be used for New Year's Day or any new beginnings, any launch of a new venture would be appropriate uh, when giving a gift to cover that gift with this fukusa. The deer themselves have very, very minute embroidered details and the birds in, are embroidered. The sun itself is couched. There are many different types of fukusa. We're going to be dealing with a type of fukusa called kakebukusa, which is the type that goes over a gift. Um, other kinds of fukusa are the um, napkins that are used in tea ceremony, uh, usually silk. There are types of fukusa used as envelopes to cover different types of cash and so forth. So in this particular ca case, you can see a typical way of using a fukusa. Uh, there's a lacquer tray. Upon this lacquer tray is going to be placed the envelope you see to the right. The right hand the envelope has money in it. This type of money is commonly given for things like, say, a funeral, in which case the envelope would be black and white, or for weddings, uh, for births, for any time you want to help someone defray the costs of something with some cash and to give a gift knowing that they can use it. And of course, cash can always be used. But cash itself is a little on the um, crude side. So very commonly, that cash is put in a beautiful envelope. The envelope may or may not be placed on the tray, like the one you see here. And then it, in turn, is covered with this fuksa. There are traditional ways of presenting a gift with a covered with a fuksa. Um, so in this case, if the envelope is placed on the tray, covered with the pine fuksa, as I walk towards the recipient, the pine tree would be facing me. As I turn the gift over to the recipient, I would turn it around 180 degrees and present it facing that person. It's very similar to what you may be familiar with through tea ceremony, where the person preparing the tea will have the tea bowl facing one way, but when they go to present it, will turn it to face the recipient, and the recipient in turn will uh, rotate it once more to pass on to the next person. It's a very um, common way of being considerate of how the other person is viewing what you're about to present. Books have come decorated with themes of just about every imaginable imagery. Um, in this particular case, we see again, hand-painted, the ancient gods of Japan standing on the bridge of the cosmos, watching two tiny birds going about their courting ritual. Traditionally, this is how the gods learn to procreate and produce mankind. You'll see these birds appearing a little bit later in other uh, types of fuksa. Most often, the theme of the fuksa should relate to either the gift or the recipient or the giver, or the receiver, or any other number of things to help indicate the educational level, the education level, the savvy of the giver, uh, to let you know that they're up to current events and up on their poetry and whatever other uh, impression they want to convey of themselves is represented in the fuksa. Uh, this particular fuksa would be one of the zodiac signs, the year of the rat, the rats are nibbling away at the grain, which indicates abundance. The owner has so much wealth and so much food that eh, 
we can tolerate the rats eating a little bit of it with no problem. Okay. Now, in this particular case, this is a very old piece. Um, it was stored away, and apparently the rats got into it and added their own little comments. So the yellow stains you see are exactly that, yellow stains. But it actually makes me like the piece all that much more for the participation of the rodents depicted. Cranes are a very common theme in Fuxa, depicted in all sorts of ways from hand paintings to weaving to couching and so forth. When you see the morning sun, the rising sun. It makes the fucus appropriate an appropriate cover for the beginning of the year, so during the new year season such as now, or for um, beginnings, launchings, new starts to things. It's a, it's a sun rising, it's a whole new day, and we're ready to look to the future. That's usually what the sun will indicate and would relate to the gift or the uh, occasion for which the gift is being presented. Fuxa may also simply represent the season during which the gift is being given. Here we see a beautiful pair of mandarin ducks. It might represent flowers. It could represent uh, a poem, as I mentioned earlier, that's popular during this particular season, a ballad, a classical production that's popular at the moment. Basically, anything can be used as a theme, as long as there's an understanding between the recipient and the giver, what's being communicated. Here we have a beautiful bouquet of irises, which would end wisteria, which would normally indicate the season of May going into June. They're embroidered pieces, and here you see embroidery combined with weaving. The upper left shows us a piece that has not been constructed yet. You can see that the fuxa is made in one long length, folded in half, so there's a front and the back, and stitched around three edges. To embroider a piece, the fabric is lashed to a wooden frame and kept trampoline taut as the artist um, manipulates the thread couched or embroidered through the, the different layers to create the beautiful imagery that he's working on. Here you can see some of the exquisite detail work shown it um, produced by a skilled craftsman. Very, very careful detail to color gradation, the flow of the lines of the feathers and so forth. And this is the overall piece you can see as the insert. Now, Something that's entirely embroidered tends to be more the exception than the rule in Japanese textiles. Most often, the embroidery will be to enhance or complement painted designs or other types of surface imagery. Um, many of the themes are zodiac themes, and this is the year of the cock would be depicted here. You can see that what are similar to French knots have been used throughout the face area of the cock, as well as the hen, to help bring some life and dimension to this piece. Couching is when the thread is laid upon the background, in this case a satin, and held down with a separate thread that is stitched through the layers. That's the orange thread. It's not unusual to have an entirely couched piece, as you see here. Generally speaking, the foundation beneath the thread is created through layers and layers of stitching, creating uh, hills and valleys, or built up layers of paper or board. Or, and nowadays, quite often what's happened is uh, what is used as a vacuum formed plastic piece over which the hand couching is applied. This is a late Edo period piece, entirely couched. You can see the eyes are painted glass. It's a very dynamic, lively, very three-dimensional piece and would have been an extremely expensive piece and representative of the wealth and status of the person presenting a gift. Again, same with this beautiful silk satin background with gold and silver couching and the glass eyeballs. This is one of the pieces I've put up, uh, one of the hooks I've put up on um, my site today, available for sale. It shows the family of cranes, the hen and the cock arriving and taking care of the little chicks in the nest. Now, all of the pine needles are couched. The cranes themselves are painted. And you can see this very, very fine, exquisitely detailed edging 
just to help outline a few of the details and bring the chicks forward in the image. I mentioned that the huxa is given as a cover to the gift. Now, they tend to be very expensive and very elaborate because the family keeps hold of it. When you use a huxa to give as a gift, that comes back to you, okay? Um, it's not part of the gift. It's simply covering the gift. Once the recipient takes hold, the fuxa may be returned at that time, or it may be returned at a later date, perhaps with a smaller gift associated with it. Now, the way that they know who it belongs to is not because they have their name magic marker in the, in the corner, it's because of the family crest. So I mentioned there are two sides. There's a surface side with the seasonal or thematic decoration, and on the back side is the family crest so that the recipient knows to whom to return the piece later. The crest itself, you can see in this sample, is in the center, the polonia leaf with the two rings. That's the crest. The chrysanthemums around the edge are not actually the crest. They're sort of a decorative frame for it. So that when this piece was being produced, the mums, the frame, would have been woven ahead of time, perhaps as part of a production process. And it was only later, once the client selects the fuxa they would like to purchase, that their family crest is then couched to the back of it. You're, I'm sure you're familiar with family crests. There are all sorts of wonderful family crest books that are out. And of course, they're used in kimono and so forth. So it's these same family crests that are used in the uh, fuxa. However, again, not all of the imagery is the crest. In this case, you can see the blue circle that's actually been stenciled in. But the background box, this is a, a container for seashells. It's a card game made of seashells. Um, that's the frame for the family crest of this particular fukusa. Uh, so there are occasions on the back where there is an image that appears where the crest normally will be, and it's not necessarily a family crest. These are sort of generic pieces that are sold that are not monogrammed or personalized for the owner, but may pretty much be used by anyone. Here again, you see the two cranes with their wing tips uh, touching, and the actual family crest is the painted peony blossom with the peony leaves. All the rest of this, the painted cranes, the tortoises, and so forth, are just extra. It's a little bit hard to tell with this piece uh, which is which. Um, this is a family crest and may appear all by itself with no embellishment, or the uh, melon blossom in the center could be the family crest with the grains of rice, the sheaths of rice around the outside, the frame. Either one would work. Another way of producing the fuxa is to use a tapestry weave. These are some of the more expensive, elaborate types of fuxa. Uh, you can see the warp threads here creating these series of lines. And as the weaver builds up and sculpts the shapes, she's using a tiny shuttle called uh, a, a little a Hina shuttle, basically, to build up the layers back and forth. Now, to tamp these threads in place, her fingernails are actually a little bit uh, saw-like. They have little tooths, little teeth, little grooves in them that help her to tamp the threads in place. This type of weaving is called tsume tsuzure. Tsume means fingernail. Tsuzure is this type of tapestry weaving. And this is an example of something woven with that technique. You can see the fuxa at the bottom and you see the tassels on it. Um, most often, when a fuxa is being used, it almost always has tassels on it, okay? However, in the course of handling, in the case of storage, over time, one will drop off, they get lost. So it's also not unusual to have the tassels removed and stored away until they're ready to be used or replaced as necessary. Um, quite often, you'll find hooks available for you as a collector without the tassels on them. It's because often we will use them to frame, we'll use them on tabletops as a table center, we may even make cushions out of them. In each of those cases, the tassels would simply be in the way. This is another uh, tapestry weave. I find this piece particularly delightful because the cranes are facing us head on. They look a little bit like painted marshmallows, actually. Um, it's not 
a form of depicting cranes that you see very much in modern times. This straight on depiction, having them look right at you is was pretty common in the Edo period and Meiji period, but not too much beyond that. In modern times, you usually see them in profile. This exquisite piece is also one that was posted today. Um, it's a tapestry weave, very high quality, showing this beautifully colored phoenix. And the red circle is just highlighting a detail on the rock that it's standing upon. And if you look below, you can see that detail blown up and show what very careful attention was put into the shading of the colors, uh, the moss outlined in gold to give extra color and um, uh, depth to the piece. So it's really quite a beautiful piece. And again, you can see the tassels attached at the top. In this case, the tassels, which are a little bit to see, difficult to see in this image, are pine cones with the tassel hanging down. Very often you'll see tortoises as the tassels or just regular tassels, or sometimes decorative knotting at the top of the tassels before the threads hang down. I mentioned earlier that we'd be seeing these birds again. So the birds, even without the ancient gods in the picture still refer to that story. Everyone knows the story. Um, it's sort of like, oh, I don't know, seeing a cherry and a hatchet, knowing that it's talking about George Washington. Okay, it's that type of thing. So here you have the morning sun again. The birds are welcoming the new year. They're welcoming mankind. They're welcoming new beginnings in this beautifully woven tapestry piece. In addition to tapestry, imagery can be produced through a draw loom, such as you see with this karaori weaving. This is a nishiki weave by the weaver Tatsumura from the early 1900s, late 1800s, very famous weaver. Um, it's a type of weaving in English we call takate, which involves many layers of thread, which only peek to the surface as they're called upon to create the image. There are also the jacquard looms, of course, that are commonly used in the Nishijin district of Kyoto. Here you see a weaver way down here at the bottom with all this huge apparatus overhead. Now this sort of conveyor belt is actually the pattern of the weave. Here's another shot of the belt looped in. If you look at the cards on the right, these are those types of uh, um, key punch cards you would have seen from the 1960s and so forth. You know, the don't spindle, fold or mutilate ones that we used to get. Each individual card here, you can see them numbered 57, 58, 59 and so forth. Each card represents one weft thread in the piece being woven. So if you have a pattern that maybe doesn't repeat, or it repeats every thousand threads, takes a thousand threads to create the uh, weft threads to create the pattern, then you need a thousand of these little bits of paper to help form the pattern. So you can see how very complicated this is. And that's why these huge loops of patterns, each one being a thread, are required to create one image, especially when there's no repeat in the image. So to produce a fuksa, you that is tapestry woven, excuse me, to produce a fuksa that is jacquard woven this way may take many, many hundreds, if not thousands of these slats that need to be punched to create the guide for the loom. In addition to the jacquard loom, you can see in the background the repeating pattern, okay? But in addition to that, the weaver has sat at the loom as the weft power weft thread is going back and forth, creating the background pattern. She's stopping it every few threads to use the individual shuttle, as we saw in the tapestry weaving earlier, to inlay this customized polonia leaf family crest for this client. So again, you can combine all these different uh, techniques to create truly fabulous pieces. Here again, we see a Nishijin piece probably produced on a jacquard loom for all of this detail. And as you can see, there's no repeat in the image at all. When collecting the textiles, I often like to find common families of things and put them together, compare them, so forth. So in this case, in the background, you can see a jacquard woven white on white crane. 
the one that you see colored is virtually the same pattern, but after having woven the white, an artist has gone in and hand applied the different colors to make the piece more alive, more dynamic. So the little caps on the cranes are embroidered. There are a few embroidered lines and the rest of it is all hand painted in. In addition to all of these other techniques, there's always velvet. Velvet's created by basically having a, a base that you're weaving. But in addition to that, you have an extra set of warp threads. And this extra set is used to create loops. The loops are cut to create tufts, the fuzzy part of velvet. Now to keep that loop up where you want it and to make them all the same height, you need to insert something. And so traditionally metal rods were inserted, but in more modern times, different kinds of rope and cording are inserted instead. So here what you're looking at is this purple gray is the cord, the spacer that the warp thread is going over, looping over, being pulled in place, move along to the next section, create another loop, move along, create another loop. And it winds up being a little bit like terry cloth if you wanna think of loops. Now in Japan, something that they do is they will of course, cut all of those loops and make velvet that we're familiar with, okay, the fuzzy kind, okay? They can also leave all of those loops and not cut them, in which case it's called wanabirodo or loop velvet. And then the really special part is when you take the loops and selectively cut them, okay? So in the upper left-hand section here, you see the woven, going to be velvet, fabric, on the loom. So you can see the purple threads in this case, cord has been used instead of metal. The cords have been woven. The grayish portion of the leaf is actually the silk looped over the purple cord. And wherever you see the purple cord, that just means there aren't any loops. Um, so there won't be any tuft or raised section. Now, once you're through weaving, you take it off the loom and you use this special kind of knife. The knife is interesting in that it has this prong that goes on either side of the loop. Each loop has a channel in between, a, a row, like, like in plowing a field, okay? There's a, a section between each loop. Those prongs go between those sections and you run it along. Now in between those prongs is a blade and the blade cuts the top of the loop consistently and evenly along the entire row. You do this selectively. The part that's cut forms a tuft. The part that's not cut stays a loop. And when you're all through, as you can see in the upper left-hand side, all of these cords or rods are removed, allowing the loops to be soft loops and the tufts to be fuzzy tufts. Now, we'll be going over all this velvet thing. I believe it's next month in March uh, for our textile of the month series. We'll be covering uh, cut velvets and so forth. And we'll go over this in the lecture then a lot more uh, in detail. But this gives you an idea. And I wanted to present the rabbit since this is the year of the rabbit. This might help you understand a bit better. The yellow part is the loop that has not been cut. The black part is that same row that has been cut just in the black area. And then of course, this was all the same color. The artist went in and dyed the fluffy area black and the looped area yellow to create the patterning. And if we now step back a little bit and look at the full fukusa, what we can see is the background gold was left as loop, giving this particular texture. But when we got to these beautiful, rich, fuzzy velvets, they cut them allowing us to have greater depth of color as they went in and individually painted each of the sections of flower. Now, the painting wasn't limited to just the tuft. You can see within this peony that the inner part of the petal was cut and tufted. The outer part of the petal was left as a loop and still painted. It's this variation of color combined with variation of texture that makes this such a wonderful piece. And this shows you the entire flower cart image. What 
you don't quite see in the previous slide. Let me back up just a minute. What you don't see is in between those rows, those furrows that I mentioned earlier. When you're looking at this, you see the silk, you see the velvet. But what happens when you drape it, those furrows open up and you see a little bit between them. And in the case of this particular one, there's gold there. There are little strips of gold woven between each of those furrows that you only see when the piece bends over the gift, exposing them to the light. And the way those gold strips are applied is what you see this fellow doing here. Now, he's not working on a velvet piece, but the gold is applied the same way. Gold is laminated to handmade paper using real lacquer. Once it's set, it's shredded into thread thin strips. And what may be difficult to see is he has a very long hook. Um, I actually carry them on my website, but it's a long wooden hook, little hook at the end. And he'll pass that through the warp threads to the other side. The hook grabs hold of that gold paper and pulls it back through, making sure the gold side is up and the paper side is down. And that gives you your gold thread. And so in weaving the velvet, you would weave a loop, raise your warp threads, pass your hook through, pull the gold, bring your warp down, add some more loops, add the gold, loop gold, so that in between every set of loops is that gold thread that I mentioned. It's just really a delightful surprise. The quality is mind boggling. This is an example of what he was weaving with just the gold no velvet in this case. So you really get to feel the luxury and the, the splendor of this luxurious gold, uh, real gold combined with the silk for the hooks that you see in the bottom corner. Um, the gold doesn't have to be flat. Those flat strips may also be wrapped around a silk core to create more of a cord. And that's what you see being woven here. And by the way, that's the same cord that we saw way at the beginning of the lecture as part of the couching thread. It's that gold on paper cut into strips and wrapped around spiral fashion to create this cording. And here are, this will be an example of a fuxa with a family crest on the back woven in, in combination with a silk gold silk woven lino weave in the back creating what might be hard for you to see but it's this beautiful delicate uh, jacquard pattern in the background and yet another detail of um, um, a classic uh, scene in japan of in japanese fuxa of the um it's basically the mountain of life it's it's the other world, um, which is also felicitous in this case. There is shibori. Uh, techniques, of course, may be used for fuksa. In this case, on the back, there's the polonia leaf family crest. And on the front is the character uh, kotobuki for felicitations. And of course, we can't overlook the hand painting of Fukusa. Some of the most exquisite examples are beautifully depicted scenes, as we saw earlier with the Mandarin ducks at the very beginning of the lecture. Here, the Yuzen uh, technique is being used in combination with rice paste resist to pre create pieces like this. You can see the box I mentioned earlier, the little container with the shells inside. Um, the shell game, uh, Kaiwase, is uh, a game where there are two shells, okay? A shell that has grown up, you know, intact will only have one mate. No other shell half will ever match that. So that's used to indicate marital fidelity, felicitations, happiness, joining, um, meeting of minds, you know, anything you want to put together like that qualifies. And so for this card game, what you have is you have one shell with a poem written upon it and the, a classic poem. On the other side, you have the illustration. And so these are put out and matched as part of the game. And of course, only the correct pair will accurately match so you know if you're correct or not. And those are stored in the shell. And that's what this fuxa is depicting. Often fuxa come in sets. So in this case, we have a set of two. We have the larger fuxa. If it's in a set, often there's small, medium, and large type of thing. So there's the larger fuxa, which is the peacock. Excuse me, the yes, is the peacock. And then the smaller one you see on the left is the peafowl, the peahen, rather. 
um, a beautifully depicted, painted pine tree, very ancient, with the cranes waiting below. This is a piece that's in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco uh, from my collection that was donated to them through one of their patrons. And you'll find that over time, as you collect pieces, as you enjoy other people's collections, you'll start to recognize certain styles and you start to find particular artists that you start to like, you look for, you, you enjoy the lines that they use and the, the delicacy and the whimsy and the humor that they use. And so this particular artist, I have no idea who he is. He's from the larger Kyoto Osaka area. That's where all of his fukusa seem to come from. But he has a very distinctive style. And so it's gotten so I enjoy watching specifically for his pieces. I only wish I knew more about him. Okay, but I really like the way that he draws faces. They, they seem to have a gentleness and a little bit of laughter behind their eyes. Beautifully painted pieces, again, with a combination of couching in green um, on the pine boughs. So when I'm talking about seasonal, um, this is obviously a seasonal piece. Here you see the fruit um, ready for picking almost. You see the bamboo shoots freshly harvested and the mushrooms freshly picked. So it needn't be something chinese -y, you know, like cranes or phoenix or something like that. Um, as we got more and more into later Edo and Meiji piece, uh, period, so many of the themes became more and more Japanese and just plain homey you know, not, not classic and celestial so much as um, everyday things, as you see here. And in that particular piece, what was interesting, as I was getting ready to photograph it for the lecture, I was backlighting it, and I discovered something inside. Um, what you're seeing here is a stamp uh, from an American bag, basically. So it's a flower sack or, or something of that nature that was used as a lining and interfacing within a hook. Now the bag itself um, would be a little bit too modern for the piece. This would be of, of uh, say around the 30s or 40s or so, whereas the fuksa it came from was much older than that. So apparently in restructuring, in re-sewing the fuksa, they used what they had, which was this American flower sack in the lining. You can't see it unless it's backlit, but it's just one of those hidden treasures inside that I like knowing is there. We've talked about using fuksa for all sorts of felicitous occasions. However, they can also be used for sad occasions such as funerals. So in this case, the lotus blossom would be used when giving money at a Buddhist funeral. And this gives you a detail of some of the beautifully delicate hand painting involved. This is one of the angels, Buddhist angels, and you can see she has the lotus blossom in hand. So here again, this would be a fuksa, very appropriate to a funeral or giving money to a temple. You know, that would be another, another occasion that this type of imagery could be used. This scowling fellow is Daruma. If you've ever seen the little red paper mache roly-poly uh, dolls, okay, that you knock down, um, that's who Daruma is. So I'm not quite sure what circumstances under which he might be used for a theme, but um, maybe uh, because the Daruma, you say um, seven times down, eight times up, so persevere, don't give up. Maybe if you're giving money to encourage a young student in taking his entrance exam, uh, entrance exams, um, maybe for the second or third time, <laughs> okay, but, but that would be an appropriate thing to say, hang in there, don't give up. There are also the seven lucky gods. This is Fukurokuju, uh, who is the god of wisdom and knowledge, learning. And you'll often see him with the staff, as you see here, with the scroll um, knowledge attached to it. He also usually has a fairly long head, indicating a lot, lot of brains in there. Here he is shown with this circle, and I'll cover that again in just a moment. But notice in this case, the circle, the flames here, are actually the tortoise's tail. So a lot of fun and imagination goes into um, illustrating things in an unexpected manner. Here you see Fukurokuju again, opening his scroll. And on the scroll, you see this Hoju. Hoju has 
it has one meaning, but it has different interpretations. So what it represents in Buddhist dogma are all of the passions of mankind. So at New Year's Day in Japan, when you ring the bell to welcome the new year, you ring it 108 times. And each of those 108 rings represent one of these passions of mankind. Now, in Buddhism, there's no such thing as a sin, like there might be in Christianity. But there are things that you want to strive to rise above or let go of so that you can advance to the next level. So in Buddhist dogma, those are things you should try to be above, try to let go of, try to be better than. But in everyday life, it's, whoa, that's the 108 things you want to try before you let go of them, okay? So as a result, the holju is one of the seven lucky treasures, something that you want to um, truly experience for yourself. So the same fellow, Kurokuju, you can see here in sort of Alfred Hitchcock style, is the outline. You can see his head here very distinctly. You can see his body is also a stylized character for kotobuki, the Chinese character we saw earlier that means felicitations. So you have many things going on here. It's obviously Fukurokuzu. It's obviously uh, this character. And it's also in combination with the tortoise shell. So you have many subtle layers of patterning going on. Now I put them in this order so that you can perhaps better see this is the same thing. So here he is again. It's that same character, Kotobuki, and you can see the staff here with the scroll of knowledge, okay? But I had to put it in that order because this might be a little bit hard for you to see on its own. Now, in it, I mentioned the seven treasures. So within these seven treasures, you see all of this hoju here. These are those treasures, the, the passions again. And that's coupled with coral and the mallet that you strike to get all of your wishes, all of these different things um, with the sun on the sail as this treasure ship comes over the horizon with the morning sun of the new year, bringing all these good tidings and treasures for us to relish over the coming year. A very good tidings for us. Again, the seven treasures. So here you see that mallet I just mentioned, which you strike. If you know the children's story, Isun Boshi, the little one-inch fella, uh, who's a little miniature guy, and he gets a mallet, and he gets to strike it, and he gets his wish, and he becomes full-size the prince, and he marries the princess, and they live happily ever after, you know. But it's, <laughs> this is the mallet that appears in that story. The bag is like a money bag that contains all your wishes, all your joys. And these dots here, coupled with the green, that's actually a stylized drawing of cloves. Cloves were a very important spice. They're one of the uh, Chinese herbs. They're also an important dye. And so just like frankincense and myrrh might be in, in the Middle East for a treasure spice, uh, cloves was looked at that way in Asia as one of the seven treasures. Now, if we look at the full fuxa, we can see the tortoise shell in the background has the plums and the bamboo. The other tortoise shell has the pine. So we have sho chiku bai. We have pine, bamboo, plum, which are considered the three sisters. The pine represents strength and fortitude and old age and wisdom. The plum represents delicate beauty and gentleness, fragility, and the bamboo uh, represents resiliency, the ability to spring back after hardship. And so those three things together are considered a traditional felicitous uh, uh, type of imagery. Okay. Now they don't, they're not always all three together. You can have plum and pine. You can have plum and bamboo, just those two. They work just fine too. And then of course, in the center tortoise here, you see the hoju, the passions. You see the mallet down below. You see a mallet above, the money bag, coral, and all these little different images in the background that make up the seven treasures. And then once more, we have the morning sun and the cranes and the waves as the sun comes up over the ocean. Cranes appear in many different ways. They're, cranes are always appropriate if you're going to give a gift of good tiding. 
Okay, and here are a few other examples of that. Here again, you see the tortoise in the background in the shape of the tortoise shell. This one might be a little bit more subtle. Um, the crane is wonderfully depicted in front, but notice the shadow of it in the back and this little sprig of plum and the pine needles are forming the outline of the tortoise shell. And then let's see, you have, uh, there doesn't, yeah, we have a plum. So we have, where's bamboo? I don't see any bamboo in this one, but as I said, it's not necessary to always be there. I included this slide to show you the beautiful delicacy and skill required for the embroidery. This is a fairly small fuksa. It's on a chidiman crepe. Crepes are very difficult to embroider upon because they do stretch and shrink, but you can see how very closely stitched this tiny, tiny band is and what care went into giving the um, outlines these beautiful gradations of color. That's not woven in, that's all stitched. Here again, we have the crane and the rising sun, but this particular crane is shown as folded paper. This is a partially folded noshi. Noshi is the paper you saw, the little shape you saw on the paper envelope at the very beginning of the slideshow um, that those little noshi items are used in gifts also. So this is one that is partially folded including the crane with the folds in place. And again, these cranes uh, wonderfully executed. Here again, you can tell, you can guess at the age better because the cranes are facing us. So again, it's going to be Edo to Meiji period, and they have the little tiny bits of embroidery on their caps. And this one is just totally delightful to me. It looks thoroughly modern in its depiction, but of course it's a very old piece, just highly stylized, almost brushstroke-like. But again, you can see that they are thoroughly involved in conversation and just a delightful piece that could be used for any occasion. And as I mentioned, um, the Japanese gradually got away from the very uh, high-class, celestial, uh, esoteric type of imagery that might be Chinese-inspired and started to do more everyday things. I like this particular piece as a dyer myself. Um, she is at the river. She is washing her fabric. Her fabric is now on the log. And as you can see in the larger detail here, the fabric is folded. Now, what happens when you wash cottons and dry them like that, they get very stiff, like a bath towel that you hang on a line rather than put in a dryer. So what's normally done is the fabric is beaten with a mallet and you see the mallets next to it. That's called colandering. Okay, calendaring rather, excuse me. It's called calendaring. And so she'll take the mallet and beat the folded cloth, which makes it softer. It's the difference of what, how stiff jeans used to be when they were brand new and how jeans were after they were worn out a bit. It's the beating that wears the fiber and softens it back and makes it comfortable for clothing. Now, it doesn't have to be every day in that sense. It can still be very Japanese, but depict uh, famous warriors, famous scenes, uh, again, allusions to poetry and so forth. And it can de depict the um, royalty, the uh, upper echelons of society as well. In this particular case, it's all hand painted. But if you'll notice, all of the metal work on the rails is done with very, very minutely scaled couching to give them that metal feel. Just that little bit of glitz brings the whole thing alive. It can be very simple. This is a lobster dyed with safflower for the yellow and the orange. And the background is done, could be done with a number of dyes, but most likely a little bit of indigo and soot would be the most direct way to produce that color. Two simple colors. Simple green, nothing fancy, very classic. And of course, there are the modern pieces, which have a little bit more humor. Um, these are three of the seven lucky gods, but you can see actually all seven of them are depicted. So this is the god of, ab of ocean abundance, fish, things like that. This is the goddess of learning, of the arts, 
This is the god of land abundance, meaning harvests and uh, hunting and that kind of thing. But then in the background, you see this pagoda, which represents the god of military arts and warriors. Okay, And if you see the staff in the back here, the staff, remember, is Fukurokuju, who is often shown with deer, but you remember me showing you him with the different characters, and we know the staff is him. So each of these gods are shown as clay dolls. This is what these are depicting, are dirt, clay, mud dolls, and then, uh, or the emblem, staff, pagoda, and so forth that are shown in association with them. It can also be a souvenir. You know, you can buy a huksa. This is like an old-fashioned postcard, you might want to call it that. So if you visit a famous shrine or temple, you can buy an artist's rendering of it. So rather than sit and pose at Disneyland and have the quick charcoal artist draw you um, to take home, you might instead have someone paint the shrine. You may paint it yourself and bring that home as a souvenir. And again, that would be appropriate for any occasion. There are also folk tales, um, fairy tales that are depicted. Most of you are probably familiar with the story Momotaro, which is the little peach boy. And so here we see the old farmer, looks a little bit haggard here, with his bundle of firewood on the back. His wife, the old lady, is at the river washing her clothes. And the Along comes the peach floating down the river, which she fishes out. Well, of course, out of the peach comes Peach Boy. He later grows up to became, become a, a famous uh, conqueror of all evil in Japan and saves the nation from all the demons that were plaguing it. But everyone knows immediately with just this little bit of imagery, the exact tale that's being depicted. Um, this one with the tree and the bird... I actually don't know what it is besides just pretty, and that may be all that it is. There's nothing wrong with just having a beautiful piece of cloth turned into a fuksa. But when my mother passed away, um, we used this to cover her ashes. So it was a Franciscan ceremony, and Franciscans are a little bit more liberal than, say, Jesuits and so forth. And so they tolerated this. Um, there's a thing called a pall, which is the black cloth that's put over a casket. So the people who carry the casket are the pall bearers. They're bearing the cloth. They're, they're carrying the cloth with the coffin. So the pall. The pall is put over the coffin, but it's also put over ashes. And so the priest had prepared a black cloth, which I thought was just kind of sad and dead. And so rather than that, I brought along this fuksa for my mother um, to, it reminded me of the Protestant hymn, uh, I'll Fly Away, which I think is just an absolutely lovely song and was a good um, representative of our attitude at her memorial. Uh, she lived a good life. We all loved her dearly and we were sending her on her way. So this is another way of fuksa. It's technically not a gift in this case, but it's still covering something precious. And as long as you keep that in mind, you can use it in any way that you see appropriate. Very typical of Meiji period is this use of positive and negative space interlacing, as you see here with the leaves. Um, I do teach classes in this type of de design work, as well as some of the weaving techniques and quilting techniques we'll be covering. But what I especially like about this one is how not only are the positive and negative images interlacing to create a border called wakezome, but the patterning below makes you sort of cock your head a little bit. So this image on the left is illustrating polonia blossoms. Okay, it's a very common crest that you see. But the polonia blossoms are illustrated with chrysanthemums. Okay, and if you start to look at the other items involved, here we see this set of wings also depicted with chrysanthemum blossoms and chrysanthemum leaves. Now, this isn't a phoenix. This is called hagoromo. Hagoromo um, are, it means angel wings. And so there are traditional Japanese stories about the angel who comes down from heaven and she sets her wings on a pine tree and she goes to take a little dip in the river. And of course, from there, the story diverges into the adult version and the children's version. So in the children's version, a farmer hunter comes along and finds the wings 
returns them to the angel and she flies up into the heaven giving blessings. So back with the Buddhist fuksa you saw early, you saw the angel carrying the lotus blossom. And so that's the type of angel that we're talking about. And these would be her wings. And then the flower adjacent to it, again, is still depicting polonia blossoms. And the leaves have a little bit more of a polonia shape to them. In this case, it actually is a phoenix and not hagoromo because the stem of this chrysanthemum forms the neck and the head. And here again, this is the piece we saw earlier of the polonia blossoms depicted entirely with the chrysanthemum. So anyway, it's just fun. Uh, someone was having fun playing around with the images, overlaying things, and just sort of um, making us think a bit. But in combining things and hiding them, or, or at least um, making them more subtle, you can see how the pine tree has simply been incorporated into the fan itself. And down below, you can see the plum. Um, to put it in a more modern context, when Americans, when we do commercials on TV, let's say it's Nike, boy, the Nike's right in your face. It's there. It's Nike. The Nike swish is there. But if you watch a Nike commercial in Japan, it's interesting. You can watch the whole commercial and have no idea what they're advertising. Maybe somebody's wearing sneakers, but you still don't know. Except at the end, in the very background, in the clouds, is a little cloud with a Nike swish. And that's the end of the commercial. That's your only clue as to what the whole commercial was about. So again, if you liken that kind of subtlety that you forces you to pay attention, to the types of fuksa we're looking at, you might have a better appreciation of the um, design humor behind them. Also in collecting things, what I like to do is gather like families together, okay, as I mentioned. And um, in this case here, again, we have the seven treasures. This page is from a kimono design book from the late 1700s. Um, and it has the seven treasures with the big money bag in the back. Now, totally independent, not related to that, is this other fuksa dyed with exactly the same thing. It's not exactly the same as the book, and it's not taken from this book, but they're virtually identical in terms of how they're depicted and the imagery shown. So in the fuksa itself, we also have some mushrooms here. We have the scrolls, we have the mallet and so forth. And here again, you can see the coral and the mallet, and this yellow thing is the clove, okay? And these other blue and brown things are also cloves. And of course, the bag itself is this bag, uh, like a money bag with all your desires and wealth inside. Now, going back to subtle a little bit, I find this piece especially attractive because of how simply and sophisticated the pine tree silhouette is incorporated into the background of the sky. It's just a very lovely, simple, classically contemporary Japanese kind of design in a very old piece. The same could be said with this, although a very old piece, it still has very contemporary, classic, modern feel to it. And the same could be said for this with the checks in the background. And as with the pine earlier, here you see the bamboo depicted in silhouette with just a little bit of life added in the couched gold and the um, gold lamination down below. Going into yet another technique, um, one of the types of hooks I like to collect are done with a technique called kiribame, which is a quilting technique, not applique, but quilting. All of the pieces are cut out jigsaw puzzle-like, covered with fabric, and then reassembled so that everything is on the set same plane. It's not built up. Um, and it is very definitely piece quilting. So every bit of fabric, you can see the stitching line where the red meets the gray or every element of her kimono. You may not see, be able to see it in the slides, but she has several pieces um, where the stitched joining helps to indicate where the folds would have been as her leaf overlaps the hem. So here we have three of the seven lucky gods again. You'll recognize our friend uh, Fukurokuju here by his tall head and the scroll. And if we flip that over and look at the back, can you see the blue cap here 
that goes with uh, Hote's blue cap. So what they've done, again, is cut out jigsaw puzzle pieces, covered each one with fabric, stitched them all together back, assembling the jigsaw together. And then the seam allowance on the back is snipped and opened flat. And that's what you're seeing on the backside. Okay, another example done that way with many different kinds of fabric. This is difficult because you're using crepes that stretch, you're using jacquards that don't, you're using thick fabrics, thin fabrics. So it really takes quite a bit of skill to integrate all these different textures. Again, uh, more of a Chinese theme. And perhaps in this case, you can see a bit better where the stitch lines in his clothing help to um, give more movement to the garments. And then finally, this is a piece that I did. Um, I do teach classes in this. So uh, I put this here so you could see the process a bit better. What I would do first is a sketch. And then I would cut out those pieces, again, jigsaw puzzle-like. And then on the right here, you can see the back side of the pieces. I'm assembling it. So each of those shapes on the left were covered with cloth that I've painted. I've dyed the cloth and then reassembled it. And then on the face side, after all of those are stitched together, you see the finished piece. So in addition to just piecing things, because I'm dyeing them individually, section by section, I can introduce other elements like how the refraction through the light changes. So here he is in his real form. And as his face is viewed through the glass of the fishbowl, it refracts one way. And as it passes through the water, it refracts and diffuses in yet another way. So you have the ability as an artist to actually paint while doing these um, very satisfying type of textile arts. And going back to the fuxa again, as it's used, um, this is a piece that I, I made, a fuxa, and it's draped over a box to show you how it might normally drape over a gift, since I haven't shown that yet. Um, this particular piece is in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. It was done for uh, a friend of mine in San Francisco. He's a beekeeper. And so I wanted to depict not only his home, San Francisco, but also his passion for bees. And I found it easiest to depict San Francisco from the North Bay with the, of course, iconic uh, Golden Gate Bridge there. And you can see the bees that I have incorporated with the wisteria. The bees have a little bit of embroidery. The Golden Gate Bridge is couched and the rest is dyed with natural dyes. So this gives you a better overall view. And he didn't have a family crest, okay? Um, he's American, so you know, doesn't come from that tradition. Um, European American. And so in that case, I made up one. First of all, I created the crane and the tortoise frame, as you saw in many of the other fuxa. But where his crest would go, I took some of the details of the wisteria blossoms and added my bee, and we'll just call that his family crest, and um, gave that to him as the gift. In addition, we saw the tassels on so many of the fuxa. Often they're removed, you know, and stored away. Um, but in this case, I wanted to have the tassels go a step further and actually reflect the bees in it. So I, as I mentioned, some are pine cones, um, some are tortoise-shaped tassels and so forth. But in this case, I took the, Jap the Chinese cinnabar beads added a little bit of gold for the wings, and then wanted to give uh, make a nod towards bumblebees, at least, by dyeing the tassel portion itself yellow and black. So again, I have bee theme tassels in combination with my bee, wisteria, golden gate, San Francisco scenery. So let's go finally on to our theme of the Takasago which uh, is what prompted me to do this lecture in the first place. Takasago um, are also called Jo Uba, uh, meaning the old man and the old woman. Uh, they're actually pine trees. They come from a no theater play called Takasago, where they're depicting a red pine and a black pine on either side of a shrine entrance. And as these pines grow old and, and except eventually, they come together and form a union. And this is 
emblematic of, again, a happy marriage, uh, a stable union, um, good tidings, stability, all the things that one might want in life that way for stability. So in the No Theater, these two characters are shown as an old woman and an old man personifying the pine trees. And they, in turn, are depicted in many on Fuxa, they're depicted as dolls, as paintings for the new year, for weddings, for any time when that type of concept would be appropriate. For this Fuxa, it's a um, late Edo period on a satin entirely embroidered and couched. This is another Fuxa with the old man and the old woman. In this case, you can see they're on a very stylized boat, we're looking at the prow, with the sail and back, and the whole thing within the circle of the sun. So again, very good tidings coming our way. A lot of times, um, I had a situation where a curator was commenting on some Japanese imagery. I, I heard her, and she was saying, oh, they're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. Well, I think she, she missed the point, <laughs> okay? It's sort of like having, oh, I don't know, um, one more cross depicted or one more paeda in Rome presented. Do we really need one more mother and child image? Really? Okay, well, that's that's not the point. Mother and child is a very endearing theme, a heartwarming theme. So the artistry comes in how the artist interprets it and depicts it, not in the theme itself. The originality is not in the theme. The theme is simply what binds us all together with a common emotion. The artist goal is to present that theme in a meaningful way that will draw us in and help us understand, in the case of Paeda, the compassion involved. So with Jouba, with Takasago, same thing. Sure, if all dog is old man and old woman, you know, who cares? Well, no, they have a place in society. Um, it's a common theme that binds all of us. We recognize it and it has meaning to us. So what I'd like to ask you to do is to notice how differently each of these artists with their own medium have presented Takasago. In this case, even though it's the old man and the old woman, it's not just showing them as old man and old woman. They are also what's called itobori dolls. These are dolls that are carved from wood with a very quick slashes of the knife to give sharp angles. So you can tell by looking at these, not only are they takasago, but they are embroidered depictions of the carved wood doll. Okay. And so again, it brings in another element, different layers of uh, participation. Now you'll notice the old man has a rake and the old woman has a broom. Okay. So so the tradition behind that is as we enter the new year, the old woman is sweeping away all the past heartache, all the trials and tribulation, all the meanness, all the bad memories, all of that negative stuff is just left behind in the old year as the old man rakes into the new year, all of the happiness, all the joys, all the friendship, all the the um shared experiences all the things that we want to treasure and keep are brought into the new year all of the rest is left behind fresh start let it go and we'll start the new year with joy and looking forward to all of the good things that are to come and so you'll see in every case the old man has the rake the old woman has the broom now it's not unusual to have a fuka or painting for that matter, where just the broom and just the rake are there. That has exactly the same meaning as showing the old man and the old woman, because as we saw with the seven lucky gods and so forth, it can be the person or it can be anything associated with them, the staff, the rake, uh, the broom, the deer, um, you know, any animal, any tool, any doodah <laughs> that's normally shown with that person can be shown by itself and we immediately know who's being depicted. Okay. Each of these faces have their own personality. Um, some are more inviting to me than others. Some I might 
like to have live next door to me, others maybe not, but they all have personality and this is to the credit of the artist depicting them. Now, look at that wonder of the old man there. Doesn't he just bring joy to your heart looking? You wonder what on earth he's looking at and what he's finding amusement in. I especially like this one as the old woman is bending down kind. You notice she's also propped herself on the root of the tree to stable her, uh, to seat herself. And yet she's bending forward with a very kindly look to encourage the little baby tortoises towards her. Okay, just an act of friendliness and kindness. And this brings us to the last slide. Um, this is what prompted the lecture. Last year in my newsletter, I greeted the new year with this image, and many people commented on it. Well, here again, you have Joel Uba, you have Takasago in their advanced age. They're greeting the morning sun of the new year. Um, it's late in their life. We don't know what the future holds for them, but they do know that they've had, they've brought with them all the joys and good memories of the past, and they greet the new year knowing that it holds what it holds. We won't stop it. It'll come but we can face it with strength and companionship and joy and anticipation and take it as it comes. And that's that's what I wish for all of you in the coming year, that um, 2023 will be bringing the very best that it has to offer to each and every one of you. And I wanna thank you for sitting through the lecture this long. Um, if uh, you're interested, please do go to my website and sign up for the newsletter. You'll be notified of this. I also have the Textile of the Month series that you can subscribe to, which gets you other sorts of benefits, such as uh, uh, discounts on things that I sell. You also get a monthly sample of the textile being discussed that month, beautiful box it comes in, and lots of other perks. So go to the website, check it out, and see if you're interested. Otherwise, I'll look forward to seeing you at the very next program, okay? So stay in touch. I'll try to too. Bye-bye.